I see a lot of guys in the industry and they, they emanate such a huge amount of confidence and they carry themselves uh, like they're entitled to be there. And I, I definitely don't feel like I'm entitled to be here. And um, yeah, I th maybe it's a common thing, but yeah, just always feel like maybe one day um, you're going to get found out and um, they'll lift the hood and um, yeah, just discover you in invading the space. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The loudest voice in the room is not always the best voice for a cause. Finding your voice in the hospitality industry can take years and being allowed to have that voice is another thing entirely. We talk of the changing nature of hospitality, traditionally a male dominated sector, but one going through change. What impact has this had on those in the industry that have felt voiceless? Erin Francis Pooley is the owner of Little Francis Wine. Erin, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me, Huck. Oh, it's great to have you here. You've um, worked in the hospitality sector and, and now produce wine. Um, tell us a little bit about um, what you're up to at the moment and um, and then we'll go back and have a look at your time in hospitality. Yeah, so so right now I'm in northeastern Victoria. We're, we're in Harvest. Um, we have majority of the grapes in, but the, the rain last week sort of slowed a few things down. So yeah, it's been sort of flat out that regular harvest work that everybody would be pretty um, familiar with where you have really long days and then maybe some nice quiet ones but yeah just <laughs> <laughs> fermentation management right now and um, yeah actually we just pressed out some pinot this morning before the weekend so that'll make a nice Easter break for everyone. You came back to Australia fairly recently what, what brought, brought about that move um, and to do what you're doing? So yeah I, I came back twice last year actually I came back the first time um, at the end of February to make wine in Victoria I'd been planning that for a couple of months it's something that I wanted to expand Little Francis to include Australian wines um, and that was sort of my opportunity so I'd planned it out and got on a plane at the end of February um, you know, there was this like virus thing happening, but I didn't really think it was a big deal because I wasn't really paying attention. Um, <laughs> and then I got here and, you know, the the plans in northeastern Victoria didn't work out, you know, for, just because the, the bushfires unfortunately sort of took out so many regions on, on this side of Australia. Um, so, yeah, that was the first time I pivoted in 2020. Um, and actually, I went out to the Barossa and Alex Head took me under his wing, thank goodness, and so made a little Shiraz and some Cabernet out there. Um, but yeah, so I was here during the, the, yeah, that lockdown. Never, I never left Australia after the shutdown because it just seemed like the safest and most sensible place to wait out a pandemic, you know, being with family and with a somewhat calm political you know, sort of spectrum and, you know, universal health care and all of those kinds of things. So, um, but then I, I came back again um, after what I thought would be harvest in California, but um, that also harvest didn't work out because of smoke, um, two massive fires in Northern California last year and, and an overlaid with a pandemic that there's the risk of making wine I think was too high for a small producer like me um, so much money to put out there and not knowing if the quality is going to you know work out so um, yeah I came back again in at the end of October and I've I've just been here ever since so yeah so it's been really great to be home honestly it's we're so lucky down here you mentioned California and the business actually started over there can you tell us how that all came about and why you settled on Northern California. Yeah, um, I moved to Northern California in 2010. Um, I just graduated from Charles Sturt at the time um, I was married to an American. So that's sort of the reason that we moved there. Um, we'd been working in South Australia and 
France and, um, yeah, and Northern California as well. So we moved to Healdsburg and I, um, yeah, you know, I was working in hospitality to kind of piece things together. They were still like, recovering from the GFC. There weren't any winery jobs beyond harvest at that time. And um, so I was working at a couple of different little restaurants there but in 2012 finally sort of bit the bullet like I've always had this idea of the kinds of wines that I wanted to make um there's table wines it's just it's always been a part of my life and and over there there was a lot of you know expensive chardonnays and pinot noirs and zinfandels and um these sort of like sun-soaked wines it was like the mid 2000s I guess so um, nothing was really affordable or engaging and um, not nothing for like everyday drinking you'd have to drink imports for that and so um, yeah that was sort of the impetus behind starting to make my own wines because yeah I just couldn't find the wines in the market there that I wanted to drink and yeah a couple of a couple of friends were making their own what had started sort of doing little projects and it's sort of like a light bulb sort of went off you know like oh if you you maybe you don't need to have this multi-million dollar building to to start making wine maybe you don't need to own a vineyard to start making wine and sort of um I saw other guys doing it and and sort of wondered if I could do that too and yeah so started really small with two two tons of semillon and um yeah been growing ever since sort of <laughs> well, tell us about those early days what it was like when you first started Did, was there anything that surprised you about trying to um, make the wines that you wanted to see um what surprised me I think you know, you know small business is is hard it's definitely more expensive than you think I think that maybe going in completely naive was the best thing to do because if you know what you're getting yourself into you probably hesitate a little bit more um it's such a male dominated area though there were no other women at the time doing what i was trying to do um barely any anyway um it's it's just so it's hard i think to to be what you can't see and so I think you like I definitely spent a lot of time reminding myself that I was the same and could do it um you know I'm I'm like a pint-sized person too not not big and big and mighty like can haul things around so I like physically you'd look a bit different than like the burly plaid shirt wearing um man that is so often um, depicted as a winemaker Um, so kind of yeah turning up at at vineyards to meet growers and I think that they definitely do a double take on this like who's this small girl walking through my vineyard Um, yeah and like yeah definitely it's happened a lot tying down a truck or something like that they they sort of make a reference to whoever's buying the grapes and and like uh, no no I'm buying these grapes These, these are mine and they people look at you funny and um but that's okay I think that it, it it's it'll change um yeah it's it's interesting I like I'd like to have more I'd love to have read more stories and just know more people who had started that path um yeah to feel like you you're not alone walking on that road you mentioned um that it's hard to be what you can't see tell us a bit about about that and um, the impact that it's had on on how you produce things and what you do. Yeah, um, gosh, I think one is it's it's a quite like you you see other people mostly mostly guys doing this and you you wonder how um, how people can do all of the things that you need to do um, and maybe it's when people have. Like, I mean, I think that you, if you have like a family, often someone's at home putting putting dinner on the table for you and taking care of the kids and all that kind of thing, especially in an industry like the wine industry and the service industry is the same too, you know, like the hours are not nine to five. They don't fit with um, 
with a standard sort of childcare situation and all that sort of stuff. So I think that there's, you, you wonder how your life, yeah, how to sort of plan that all out and how, how it all fits together and works. Um, yeah, I don't know if I really answered the question, but it's, I think that you see, like I see a lot of guys in the industry and they, they emanate such a huge amount of confidence and they carry themselves uh, like they're entitled to be there. And I, I definitely don't feel like I'm entitled to be here. And um, yeah, I th maybe it's a common thing, but yeah, just always feel like maybe one day um, you're going to get found out and um, <laughs> you just, they'll lift the hood and um, yeah, just dis discover you in invading the space. But yeah. Um, yeah, so it's different, different experience, I think. You started uh, in the hospitality sector before moving into wine. Uh, take, take us back to those early days when you first started in the hospitality sector and, and what drew you to the, a career in it? I've always loved food. Um, yeah, always been engaged in that kind of thing. And I, the first I mean, more serious hospitality job that I had was like a cafe, um, you know, going th through uni to support yourself through uni. But I remember um, wh I didn't want to just work in a cafe. I wanted to like learn how to be a barista and make like sick drinks um, because I really loved coffee and I just, I, I saw basically like baristas were, were my heroes and I, I loved that pace, people putting out all these beverages and so I really, I really loved that. But the, I think that the takeaway at that time was like ta really taking care of people because, you know, in the mornings you people come in and they want to get their, their latte or their cappuccino or their hot, skinny, flat white or how, whatever, whatever it is that they want. But you see that customer, that regular walk through the door and you make eye contact and you, know, you like nod and you start their beverage and it's ready for them as soon as they've finished like paying and then they're off on the train going to the city or whatever it is. Um, and on their day, like on the way, on their way and um, being able to take care of people and like get to know your customers and your regulars. And that was a real I think rush and I and I loved it and and I think I've carried that through service in all of the different places that I've worked over the years um yeah just it's, yeah just really con connecting I think that I mean it's table side if it's fine dining but it's just over a little coffee but it's still just as important um to offer that service you, you, when you were talking about uh, winemaking and um, the male dominate, dominated side of that, um, hospitality industry is renowned for that as well. But what were the challenges involved for you um, with your career in, in hospitality in, a, in an industry that historically has been so male driven? Hmm. Um, I mean, cafes in Sydney were, that was actually a female owned cafe I worked in. So that there was there were no barriers there, which was great. But, um, in, in California, I don't, I don't know if I necessarily had any challenges there with, um, I actually think in a way that I had an advantage because I'm actually, quite, I, like I said, I'm quite small. So, um, I don't tower over a table, um, and I'm not intimidating at all. Um, in that in that way, so maybe I could get away with a lot more than than men in the same space. Um, but you definitely don't carry the authority, you know. Um, I gosh, I remember even like back when I was a teenager working at a pizza place and telling the you know big macho Italian owner something like some kind of instruction, like we needed something. And he just like yelled at, yelled back at me, like, how dare you woman talk to me this way. And, and as I quickly learned to get anything done around there that I needed to tell the, the, the footy guy that I was working with, um, to tell, you know, the owner what we needed. And then, and then he would go, ah, yes, I received message. I respect, you know, I respect the message because it had come from this, like, you know, rugby playing 17 year old instead of this like little opinionated, um, 
girl. <laughs> so I think that, I mean, yeah, that was just more like a lesson, but yeah, I, mean, I hope that that part of the world is changing. Um, I don't feel like there was any discrimination though in, in the restaurant, um, in the restaurants that I worked at. There were loads of women in the kitchen, especially at Cyrus when I was there. Um, and load, yeah, lot, probably 50 50 while I was there. Um, maybe less so at the restaurant at Meadowood. Um, but I don't think that that was, um, that I think that was just based on applications more than anything. You fell in love with uh, service and that art of hospitality. Um, what, tell us about the time when you started to think about producing your own wines and, and how you came to that decision. Just wanting to, you know, I've always had in mind what I wanted to make. And I think maybe the traditional way to go through the industry is to get, get a job in a winery like entry level and then work your way up through the ranks and then maybe one day break out on your own. Um, I think that that's sort of what you see, you see that a lot. Um, but, you know, it was so hard for me to get in entry level when I graduated. Um, so I just didn't go that route. I was like, well, all I need is some cash to get started. So um, that's all of my fine dining paychecks went into buying grapes um, and glass and labels and all of the things that, you know, you warehousing, all that stuff, all the fun stuff. Um, and yeah, I, I just, I, I knew what I wanted to do. So I didn't want to work for 20 years for somebody else making their wine their way um, before I could w would have permission to do it myself um, yeah so I think I'm maybe an impatient and quite determined person so I just decided it and now and now now I'm doing it um, yeah still kind of pinch yourself every day that it's actually happening though I think yeah taking it on yourself and um, being determined like that to do it yourself. Uh, has there been any sort of hurdles or mistakes that along the way? So, so, so many. <laughs> uh, the whole thing is a hurdle and a mistake probably. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's a wild ride. I think there's, it's just like, there's so many amazing ups and <laughs> there's so many downs. Yeah. One day you're like paying all your bills and the next day you're wondering how you're going to pay your bills. But, um, yeah, I, I was so lucky in, in California to have a really supportive custom crush, um, group of friends who helped that not only was it just like an honor to make wine in their winery every year and be with with them um, but they would always help when I needed things filtered or racked or topped or sulfured or you know when I was in Australia bottled you know all of these things so it had a, an amazing community so I think when you're doing it alone like I have been doing it you you really have to build up a big community and um, and it's so hard to I think accept help um it's so hard to reach out and ask for help as well um so you know I th yeah I, I I'm very grateful for there's been so many people around me that have been encouraging over time and 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 still are today um and you know and that's in the Californian wine industry and also Australia and, and kind of global actually now because you know, got, going to Charles Sturt, you to study with people all over the world. So um, kind of you have a big global network. But, um, yeah, it's it's really nice. Um, I think, it, you know, it's a team sport, right? So service, the service industry, you, you can't run, run a restaurant alone and definitely the wine industry is, is really connected and, and really supportive of each other. So You set out on this path to make the sort of wines – um, that you wanted to see and and enjoy. Can you tell us tell us about some of the wines that you make and how they how they stand out? I my first love is is Semillon. Um, I you know and I guess that sort of maybe answers your question from earlier. Like I was in California and saw this Semillon available and there was no one in 
California, well, I didn't know at the time there was another one other producer, but um, making Semyon in like a hunter style and that really nice early pick, retain the acidity, ferment it, bottle it young and then let it age. I didn't understand why uh, why Californians weren't doing that because to me, like, I mean, I'm from Sydney and, and Semyon kind of flows like water over there, I guess, and it's just like the best thing in the world. Um, especially when it's old. Um, yeah, so I really um, wanted to see, that was the, like, I'm curious, right? Like, is the Semyon, does the Semyon taste the way that it does out of the Hunter because of the Hunter or is it the grape variety? Like, can I make that sort of style of wine from these grapes in Lake County, um, California? And uh, it turns out that, yeah, they're similar. It's not the same, of course, but, um, yeah, the, the wine comes in, it like ferments to less than 11% alcohol and it's dry and we bottle it really young. And, and then after a couple of years in bottle, it's just blooms like it blossoms into this like textured savory um like lanolin um lemon curd it's it's just like a weighty wine and but it has no no like alcohol power behind it so i just it has so much flavor and complexity and you know tastes good ice cold and tastes good as it warms up and it works with raw vegetables and it works with a roast chicken and everything in between you know like it's just a really flexible wine and something that I just I can't imagine ever getting tired of drinking those kinds of beautiful dry savory complex white wines um yeah, so that I yeah, so I started with Semyon in 2012 and and have made that all the way through, um, and yeah, I have, so I've but I age it before release. So like in Australia, my current release is the 2015, um, and in the states they've just started on the 2016s. Um, so yeah, it's it's not a good business model for anybody who's listening and thinking about going into the aged semion business <laughs> like you have to wait a long time before you get a return but so uh, to complement that I did I started um saying in the same vein of like a textured white wine California is so amazing with Chenin Blanc from sort of just near Sacramento the Delta area um though it's sort of an un I mean, it's been around for decades and decades going into big box plonk sort of quantity over quality wines, but uh, it's really changing as a new generation of younger viticulturalists and vineyard owners um, that are bringing the quality over the quantity. And um, so, yeah, I, I've been working with Chenin Blanc for a couple of years now and, and I, I always – barrel ferment that and it brings out a sort of nice like almond peach and like beautiful texture because I don't you know I, I don't do I try the minimal like minimal intervention you know all of the buzzwords that are out there now but um like the Chenin Blanc ferments in neutral oak so old old French barrels um and so there's no temperature control so it just sort of naturally stirs itself and um and and ferments and then settles and then we bottle it and it's just delicious um very moorish so and um and with that i also been playing with merlot as well so been um sort of captured my attention with that sort of blue and purple sort of it has a real joyful fruit profile on the vine and um so i really like we've been trying to bottle that energy that bright that brightness that um plush fruit um without it being insipid and like simple um but yeah so that I've been working with a couple of different sites and actually have some King Valley Merlot that's just been pressed off here um it's in tank ready to go to barrel and I'm yeah so I'm excited about that um as well yeah it's lots of curiosity and experimentation and just seeing what what kind of flavors you can capture to bring to everybody's dinner tables you started in california and uh, now you're in victoria um is it 
Is there differences uh, between the grapes and the processes that you go through with those two um, regions? Yeah. I mean, for one thing, there's um, there's no labour force here in Australia. There's no um, immigrant labour force. Um, so everything is hand harvested in California because there's just like massive amounts of people who can pick an entire vineyard in in a couple of hours and it's really, really remarkable how hard everybody works. Um, and th- that just doesn't exist in Australia. Uh, I think it's I, one thing that's been a big change actually in Victoria especially is there's a lot of birds, um, which is so lovely because I really – I've been enjoying watching the birds um, where I'm at. There's there's all these gang gang cockatoos that I'd never seen them in the wild before, and oh, they're just amazing. But um, yeah, so there's like a lot of bird damage, and so netting is really important uh, in Australia, where I've never seen a single vineyard I think netted in in California. But well, you know, they just they have I don't know. It's like so much labor, so there's just a lot of meticulous farming. Um, and I mean, I was in Napa and Sonoma, so it's a pretty like fancy, expensive wine regions. But yeah, there's like not a leaf blade out of place over there. It's like one cluster per shoot, and um, and not not like a high ROI. I think on the grapes in terms of like tonnage, but. Um, in Australia, I think that, yeah, it's a bit, because there's less labour, more mechanisation, there's a little bit more, the vineyards are a little bit more relaxed, uh, we've got a little less water, um, but yeah, that, yeah, that's, 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 I think it just really comes down to approach and labour, but otherwise fermentation's kind of the same. You've got uh, friends back in the US and um, you mentioned earlier that you're um, very happy to be here in Australia given what's going on sort of globally still. Um, Have you spoken to anyone back there? What's your feelings about what's happening back in the States compared to sort of where Australia is at in regards to the pandemic? Yeah, so I'm so excited and heartened by a lot of my friends in agricultural areas all uh, have been vaccinated now um so yeah that that rollout the vaccination rollout is much faster and the approach has been much different than here whereas we're going with these age brackets um and maybe like exposure risk with with frontline workers um they at ag anybody in the ag industry was able to get their jabs like uh, I don't know, they think they started in about February. So um, that that's all really good to see. Um, but other than that, like, I think that the restaurants and social distancing stuff is all really county by county and state by state. It's so different. Um, I know that dining has op- started opening up in, in some areas like San Francisco. I've got a friend working the floor in San Francisco, he said they're at 25% capacity. Um, but, you know, that. so the masks are still part of every single day for for Americans that are, um, I don't know, it, it's, a, it's very political in the US. So I don't think that Australia has the same kind of division, political division in terms of how to, how to um, be safe around other people. But, yeah, so... I'm just so glad to see everybody getting vaccinated and can't wait for everybody here to get their jabs too. Given you started in California and uh, you came back to Australia to explore some opportunities but then ended up having to stay here, what's um, what's your plans? Are you, do you see yourself staying here to produce wine ongoing or do you have plans to go back? Yeah, no, I definitely plan on um, making wine here ongoing. I'd like to make wine in California again too but I don't think that that's on the cards for 2021 um so just trying to be patient and let let all of the last 18 months kind of dust settle it's been it's been pretty disruptive and difficult to make plans but no I'm I'm enamored with with the Victorian like 
wine scene. There's so much to explore here. I, um, I've got so many questions and none of them are answered. And so I hope, I hope that, uh, yeah, just there's so many things that I want to ferment and experiment with. <laughs> um, but you know, I just got here like five minutes ago, so I don't, I don't know a lot of people and I don't, um, don't have my foot in, in the door like that yet. So it'll be a little, it'll be slow to get started, but that's all right. Um, yeah, it, I think it's so interesting. Victoria is such a diverse little state. Um, yeah, it's, I think maybe the palette for wine here could be endless. So, um, yeah. You mentioned you've got so many questions that are unanswered. What, what are some of the things that you're, you're exploring or want to sink your teeth into? Uh, so many things that I can't act on this year because, um, yeah, grapes take a long time to establish. But, you know, one, one of the things, just like looking at what varieties are, uh, are available here and you know and that's one big difference actually between California and Australia is that we have a big quarantine um, situation and everything has to be on rootstock um, and then there's the overlay of phylloxera in Victoria being pretty patchy and and um, making logistical movements a little bit more challenging um, but yeah just seeing what grapes are here what's doing well um, what what's already established and maybe could we w ferment differently um, just to like I'm interested in northeastern Italian varieties I think that's where my mum's family's from originally and so and I worked a lot with um, you know some really close colleagues in the states who were working with a lot of Pinot Grigio, Friulano, um, Ribolla Gialla, all of these, all of these things. I'm curious to see how th those flavors are expressed up, up here too. Um, plus, I'm still stuck on Merlot and maybe some Semillon in the future. Um, and just getting back to like a co-fermented vineyard sort of. I guess in down here maybe like you think about it as like a fruit salad pick, um, that whole you know growing varieties side by side and harvesting them together, fermenting them together so they're so they're unified from the beginning and um, yeah just creating a wine that has more natural sort of balance from that point instead of getting a whole pile of different little lots in a lab and blending them together to the percentages um, I really I really love the the practice of you yeah, harvesting a whole vineyard and making the you know, it's a field blend and um, getting that harmony from the from the very beginning you've um, you made the move from the US to here and you're happy to be here but um, what sort of impact has the last year had on you has it changed you and, and what you do I've yeah it's changed yeah definitely it's been a bumpy one um I think I was heading for a lot of a lot of change before the year really got under road but like what I've loved the most about this whole sort of shutdown period is how um you like you just slow down a little bit and definitely more cooking at home more time with family and which for me living overseas for so long um I had a lot a lot of family time that I needed to catch up on I think and um and friends too and just I think that because you don't see your friends and family that often now when you do see them it's like dining out at a restaurant when you do go out at a rest to a restaurant it's it's um it's really special and and I think you don't take as much stuff for granted and yeah just slowing it down not working like 80 hours a week burning the candle at all of the ends um just to pay rent and insurance and all of the like boring stuff because that at the end doesn't matter at all um the people in your life are, are what matters the most so I think that's what's changed and just I I I I've like this last 12 months pulled the ripcord on my salary safety net so that's been the biggest change is that I'm all in on little little Francis now and 
it's it feels really different to be dedicated to my own business instead of splitting your splitting your energy between someone else's business and and then doing yours on the weekend or the evenings and um, around the edges so um, I think that's the biggest change those two biggest changes well Erin um, it's been fascinating to hear your story and look forward to seeing uh, your wines uh, featured across the country um, we've loved having you on deep in the weeds and um, please keep in touch and uh, we'll talk again soon thanks so much and thanks so much for just telling all these small stories that you're telling from everybody's lives it's it's really it's really so great so i appreciate the time and energy you're spending doing this thanks erin um we'll talk again soon this is the deep in the weeds podcast i'm anthony huckstep stay tuned as we share the stories of australia's hospital community suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.